Welcome to Talking Science. Dr. Danny Price from Curtin University is here to discuss the recent finding of earthbound interference in a signal detected from Proxima Centauri. Danny, thanks for your time. Thanks for having me. This is Trexone's Talking Science. And don't forget, Trexo membership available via the join button under each video on YouTube or via the trek.zone slash support. Plus, Trexone's on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and your favorite podcast feed. Find us, like, follow, and subscribe. Danny, let's start at the beginning. What was first thought to have been detected by Murray Young in 2019? Well, uh, we did some observations of Proxim Centauri, which is our nearest stellar neighbor at about 4.2 light years away. We're using the Parkes Murray Young Telescope, and uh, we sat on that data for a while because there was other stuff we were doing. We were looking for solar flares and um, doing a big multi-wavelength campaign with lots of different telescopes. But we set a portion of that data aside, the SETI data aside, uh, to look for uh, techno signatures, which are any signal that uh, doesn't appear to be natural in nature and coming from outer space. And in 2020, my summer student, Shane, Shane Smith, uh, went through that data and found something interesting. And it wasn't until December 2020 when uh, the, the news kind of broke and the cat got out of the bag that we had found something interesting. Very, very cool. Well, sometimes I don't like it when things get double checked because it means the original idea or results could be wrong. As it was in this case, I suppose it's better to know the truth, uh, which was what exactly? What happened? Well, we always, uh, you know, there's a very high bar to before you can say this is uh, life beyond Earth, and, and we, we hold ourselves to that, so we didn't let ourselves get too excited. Uh, but someone in the team did get a little bit too excited, and uh, it was uh, released to the media that we found something in December when really we probably would have waited a bit longer and uh, until we were really ready to say what we thought it was. Uh, but this year, you know, we, we spent, since that came out, a, a good nine months just going through and analyzing the data exhaustively, and we were able to say that it was something a lot more boring. It was radio interference from here on Earth. Interesting radio interference, a kind we haven't seen before, but uh, radio interference nonetheless. Now, I guess this is why Murray Young, or the Parkes Radio Telescope, lives in a sheep paddock, Tidby Miller 2. As Glenn Nagel once said to me, sheep don't have mobile phones or electric grids, but we still pick something up. How did the corruption happen into the signal? Well, these telescopes are very sensitive. So Parkes had its 60th birthday this year. And since then, it's tens of thousands of times more sensitive than it was uh, when it was originally built. When it was originally built, it was already very sensitive. Um, there's a statistic that the amount of energy that has been collected in the radio regime uh, with telescopes is less than the amount of energy that a snowdrop would impart on the floor when it hits it. So that's just saying how incredibly sensitive these things are. And the signal we, we picked up was incredibly narrow band, meaning all of the energy was um, focused into one frequency. Uh, and we you know this big telescope has a, essentially a massive gain. And so it's an incredibly, incredibly faint signal we found. Um, some kind of interference from somewhere within the closest 100 kilometers. And it's probably some kind of malfunctioning radio amplifier. And I guess that's the other thing as well. 60 years ago, Parks was literally in the middle of nowhere and was perfectly situated. Now, as, as a society, uh, you know, spreads out and gets even closer, and not only that, we're also using more of the radio spectrum here uh, on Earth uh, with different uh, types of radio broadcasting equipment. Um, these things are going to crop up, I guess. Now, BLC-1 was the name of the detection. Uh, and as you say, it was looking or it was thought to have found a techno signature. That's evidence of alien technology. Uh, again, as you say, something not naturally occurring. Uh, in terms of postulating, Danny, do you think that, that those types of signals are out there somewhere just waiting to be discovered? As a scientist and uh, as a SETI researcher, my job is to answer that question whether or not they're there. Um, you know, so I'm not going to give you a definitive answer. I hope they're there. Um, I think that there's life beyond Earth for sure. The, the, the question is you know, whether or not we can detect it and whether or not intelligent life or life that uses technology or produces these kind of artificial signals is something we can find. That's a, that's a different question to whether or not it's out there. So, uh, but fortunately, in our lifetimes, um, as long as NASA and the other space agencies keep going, we'll have an answer to whether or not there's you know, simple life within the solar system. Uh, so we, we may find through different means that we're, we're not alone. Well, what's it like being part of the SETI search? Uh, obviously, that is the whole mission, search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Uh, I remember as a kid that you could download the program onto your Windows 98 PC uh, and run it as a screensaver, churning through the data. 
Um, now it's obviously getting bigger and bigger. It's, uh, you know, um, churning through a lot more uh, information and a lot more recordings out there. Um, but, you know, another statistic as well is that we've only been searching for a couple of decades uh, and that really doesn't even get us to our nearest star of Proxima Centauri uh, in terms of the speed of light. As a scientist, it's kind of a, a dream job. You know, when I was 12, I used to love this kind of thing. And, uh, you know, I read a report on SETI, which I had completely forgotten about until my mum showed it to me a few years ago. Um, so uh, I think it's a, it's a fantastic kind of science because it really engages the public into other, you know, astronomy and things. And it really, it's, it's something which, um, a, a gateway essentially into, into other sciences. So we've had a lot of, you know, sort of the student who led the paper, for example, um, the, the BLC1 paper that we released uh, was an undergraduate student. Um, and you know, hopefully he will continue and have a career in astronomy. Uh, and similarly, we collaborate with a, a lot of other astronomers because the kinds of equipment, the kinds of searches we need to do have very high resolution and the high resolution is very useful for other science. And so it's really good in terms of technologic, technological development and uh, development of, uh, of skills as well, as well as it just being an awesome science case I mean, it'd be one of the most profound things. I'd be, uh, I'm, you know, really happy to be involved with the search. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the Breakthrough Listen project uh, is the one that made this discovery. Uh, I am obviously work continues on that, uh, looking out uh, and listening out for things uh, in the future. Is there any anything sort of uh, coming up in the pipeline? Any other sort of uh, discoveries at the moment? Yeah, so it's a 10-year project. We're about halfway through. Uh, the, the big thing coming up is we're, we'll be turning the Meerkat telescope on or our systems at the Meerkat telescope, which is a 64-dish array in South Africa in the Karoo Desert. And it's a fantastic new uh, telescope that was built uh, as a kind of pathfinder toward the ultra-mega square kilometre array, uh, half of which we're getting here in Western Australia. The other half will be going to South Africa. Um, uh, so we're turning on Meerkat, our systems there, and it will just be fantastically more sensitive. And we'll be able to do a new search where we can look at lots of different target stars at once. And the goal there is to survey a million nearby stars to the local neighbourhood and search for any signal uh, that is in any way anomalous. Very, very cool. Well, Danny, I really appreciate your time on today's Talk in Science. Good luck with the rest of the Breakthrough Listen project. Thank you. 